So here we start part three, which is angular momentum changed. So this is the uh, character of torque. And this is also on the piece of paper that I handed out. So if we have um, forces acting a distance x from a rotation axis, then x times f is the magnitude of the torque. And in this balanced case, I've taken two forces, so I've got this extra two. But the essential bit is it's force times distance. And we have a turning effect of this, which is uh, defined uh, upwards like this. And therefore, we need the vector product to be sure where the torque or the angular force points. It's a vector. And so here we have it. The torque is the displacement vector from the axle from where the torque, uh, from where the force is being applied, crossed with the force itself. So T points in the direction of R cross F. And again, I can see people already practicing where it points. Very good. So are you assured that it points in the direction that I've indicated at the top? I hope so. So R down towards the end of the rod, curled around in the direction of F, and the your right thumb points in the direction of T. So angular uh, Newton 1 said that the spin uh, or angular momentum L is constant when there are no torques. So a good example of that is this wheel. It's got a very low friction bearing, and since we put it down, it's continued rotating. Its angular momentum is pointing towards the board, and there's been very little frictional torque from the bearing to change its magnitude of its angular momentum. And here's a nice simple example of Newton's second angular law, which is the torque is the rate of change of angular momentum. Do you remember we had before F is equal to dP by dt. Here we have T, the torque, is equal to the rate of change of angular momentum with time. So the dot is d by dt. So the, the example that's on there is one that we can see with our friend the wheel. And here it is. I've got the wheel. I apply a force tangentially like this. And that force times this distance gives us the magnitude of the torque. And the torque is pointing upwards. So if we have a torque, remember the torque points this way and the torque is along the angular momentum, it will change the magnitude of the angular momentum. It's like giving a ball traveling this way a push with a force that way. It travels faster in the current direction it's moving. So I have this, and I apply more and more torque. I get a larger and larger angular momentum pointing in this direction. So that's a simple case of where the torque and the angular momentum point in the same direction. Now, you remember from circular motion that it be, was interesting because the force and the, so we've, we've discussed that one, that's spinning up a, a bicycle wheel, the torque points parallel to the angular momentum in the, in the middle slide so that the blue angular momentum increases and becomes this longer green value at the end. Now, we want to return to the big question we started with. What about the floating of the wheel through the air? And this is what, where you come to the point where the angular uh, versions of Newton's laws combined with torques that don't point, point along the angular momentum are much more interesting. So let us look at this situation, and I'll get my wheel out to demonstrate it uh, where we look at it. First of all, we've got a, a wheel. It's turning like this, and its angular momentum is pointing along this axle. Now, the torque comes from lifting on this side and the weight force in the middle so that the turning effect is like this. So the torque vector points where? That way. It points over there. The turning effect is like this. The torque vector points that way. So we've got the angular momentum pointing this way. Let me turn around so everybody can see. The angular momentum is pointing that way. The torque is pointing that way. So that the angular momentum 
this way, has to change in that direction. Do you remember the tennis ball flying around on the end of the string? The force was not along the velocity, it was perpendicular to it. Here we have the angular momentum this way and the torque that way. So if we believe in what we've just said, that the rate of change of angular momentum is, is this way, because it follows the torque, then the wheel can't fall down. So let me try and put that to the test. There's the angular momentum pointing away from me, and the torque is constantly pointing that way, perpendicular to the changing angular momentum. Spin this the other way. The angular momentum is now pointing where? To me. The torque, when I pull with this cotton, will be... Torque, the angular momentum was this way. The torque is that way. So the angular momentum pointing to me must move around like that. So let's see if that's the case. And indeed it is. Sorry, it's getting a bit tired. There's a bit of friction in there. So I hope you agree we've managed to explain using simple mathematics, that is the vector cross product and the ideas of angular momentum, which, well, we've explained how this thing manages miraculously to float through space and in particular which direction it will process in. So here's the summary of that that you might like to look at. The angular momentum is pointing that way. The change in the angular momentum is along the torque, and so the angular momentum has to drift around in this horizontal circle. So we've tested that by looking at the wheel. Another thing that depends on precession, which is what this is, is the boomerang. But the boomerang is even more subtle because it not only processes for the reasons we've just given, but it's also got lift, which keeps it, um, keeps it up, and it goes in a circle, like we've seen here with the wheel, and it returns if you do it right. And it's really easy to make little balsa wood boomerangs, and we have flown them in this lecture theater and seen them come right back. But that's another lecture.